Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron. In today's video lecture, we'll focus on slider crank mechanisms. And in particular, we want to look at the kinematics of these kinds of linkages. So what are slider cranks? Well, they're mechanisms and linkages as shown here. And their role is to convert between linear and rotational motion. One of the most common examples of slider cranks can be found in your car engine. So you could think about this slider as representing the piston in your engine. Maybe a combustion process occurs up here, force is applied, and it drives this piston to the left, and as a result, ends up rotating this blue link, which could be connected to the drive shaft of your car. Right? So basically, that slider crank mechanism converts the linear motion produced by the piston and the combustion process into rotational motion, which ultimately makes the wheels go round and round. Here, in this picture, I've kind of drawn, drawn a couple of different configurations. Obviously, there's this blue and red configuration, but then I've kind of in light gray shown some other configurations. So this one could be extended, right? This is when it's, it's moved back to the left. And again, as it comes all the way down, eventually this blue link could rotate around and then come back and the slider would move further to the right. So again, um, this would convert between linear rotational motion. Other examples, we could connect a motor to the blue link, and that would be the input. And then as this blue link moves around, the slider would, would translate back and forth. So again, this mechanism converts between motion in terms of theta 2 and motion in terms of x. Um, the input could be either one, and then the other could be the corresponding output. So here's the question. I'm going to give you L2 and L3, and I'm going to tell you that theta 2 is 60 degrees. So we're really thinking about this blue link as the input link. And then I'd like to find the displacement of the slider. So what's the value of x that corresponds to this configuration? So again, in this picture, the light blue link is the input, and then the slider represents the output motion. So now, to analyze this, right, we'll recognize that we have a pin joint at the point we'll call O2, and that connects the blue link to the ground, and then the blue and the red link are connected at A, and then finally we'll call the slider point B. Right, so that's the point that translates back and forth. I've already given you the input and, you know, effectively the output variables, but there's a third unknown here, and that represents the inclination of this red link. Right? So that we need a third variable, and we'll define that as theta 3. So here we have three variables, theta 2, theta 3, and x. And our kinematic analysis will allow us to relate theta 2 at 60 degrees back to the displacement of the slider. And as part of that, we'll also get the inclination of link 3 if we, if we so choose. So again, this is a one degree of freedom mechanism. If I have one of these coordinates, then I can find the other two. So how do we start off here? Well, I've drawn a skeleton of this mechanism here. So again, we have O2, we have the point A, and we have the point B. And our loop closure equation will represent this sort of closed kinematic loop. All right, so... There's a vector from O2 to A, and then a vector from A to B. And we'll say that that is equal to the vector from O2 to B. So again, this vector is R of A with respect to O2, R of B with respect to A, and R of B with respect to O2. So, the loop closure equation
can be written as R of A with respect to O2 plus R of B with respect to A is equal to R of B with respect to O2. So now notice that the vector from A to O2 has fixed length, as does the vector from B to A, and that's L3, while the vector from B to O2 has fixed direction. But the, but the, the length here is, is unknown. That's, that's in fact x. So let's go through and define some appropriate directions. Uh, as always, we'll start with I and J fixed in the ground. And then for this input link, we'll identify the direction along the link as I2. And the corresponding perpendicular direction is J2. And this angle is theta2. Now for link 3, we'll identify the direction along that link as I3 and then J3 is the perpendicular direction while theta3 is in this case the clockwise angle that describes the orientation of this third frame. Notice that for link 2, theta 2 is defined positive counterclockwise and theta 3 is defined positive clockwise. Right, so now, with these, I can write my loop closure equation as L2, and then in blue I'll write this input direction, plus L3, and then the direction of the third link is I3, equals X in the I direction. All right, so notice that I've, I've tried to color the input part blue, and the unknown output variables are both in red. Right, so theta two can change, right, in this picture, right, but we're going to try to find the the configuration at sixty degrees. Theta three and x can also change, and they are unknown at this stage in the problem. All right, so. So here we have all that again, just for reference as we're, as we're watching the video. Uh, again, as always, feel free to pause this video and, and go back and kind of make sure that you understand how these things are defined and why this looks like this. Um, great thing about video lectures is that you can pause them at any time. Right, so now, this is the loop closure equation right, that we are going to be working with. And how do I want to solve this? Well, I'll write components in the i and j direction. I'll come up with scalar equations, and then I'll try to solve those for x and theta 3, which is embedded in this i3 direction. Right, so the first step to that is relate directions. Right, so we'll relate these bases, i2, i3, to i and j. So i2 here, right again this is the angle theta 2 is counterclockwise so we see that's cosine of theta 2 in the i direction plus sine of theta 2 in the j direction and for completeness I'll go ahead and define j2 and that ends up being represented as minus sine i and cosine j. i3 a little bit different because again theta 3 is defined positive clockwise right so that's going to be cosine of theta 3 in the i direction but now minus sine of theta 3 in the j direction because of course if theta 3 is positive then i3 ends up being in the minus j direction j3 is sine of theta 3 i plus cosine of theta 3 j. Notice that, that these have been drawn for, you know, relatively small values of, of theta 2 and theta 3. Um, makes the geometry a little bit simpler. But these relationships are actually valid for any angle, right? If theta 3 is, you know, 30 degrees or so as shown, right, these work out. But if theta 3 was, you know, 275, 
right? Wherever that would be, it'd be, you know, where up here somewhere. All these would still work out. This is correct for any angle theta 3 and also for any angle theta 2, right? So now going back to the loop closure equation, we can take these directions, substitute them in, right? And we get L2 cosine of theta 2i plus sine of theta 2j plus L3 cosine of theta 3i minus sine of theta 3j equals x in the i direction. Right, so this is the loop closure equation written in terms of i and j. Now we need to take components, right? So in the i direction, we end up with L2 cosine of theta 2 plus L3 cosine of theta 3 equals x. And then in the j direction, we have L2 sine of theta 2 minus L3 sine of theta 3 equals 0. Right, so these are our two scalar equations for the kinematics of this slider crank mechanism. So we need to solve these. How do we do that? Well, we'll solve for one of these variables and then introduce it into the other equation. Right, so here we're ultimately interested in x. So let's go ahead and solve this equation from the j direction for theta 3. Okay. So we see that sine of theta 3 equals L2 sine of theta 2 divided by L3. And that ends up being equivalent to the law of sines for this triangle that we've drawn over here. So we can solve this, right? We'll take our values for L2 and L3 that were given in the problem statement. L2 is 50 millimeters, L3 is 100 millimeters, theta 2 is 60 degrees. Throw it all in here, solve for sine, right? So here, sine of theta 3 is 25.66 degrees. And so we can go back to the equation in the i direction and find that x is equal to, well, it's L2 cosine plus L3 cosine of theta 3. And working that out, I get 115.14 millimeters, right? So this is the displacement to the right. Notice that in this step, I now know what theta 3 is. I couldn't have done this directly after, you know, separating out the loop closure equation because I didn't know theta 3. I've got to go through and solve this equation for theta 3 before I can plug it back in and ultimately solve for x. Now, we've seen some tricks in the past where maybe we can not worry about theta 3 and directly write equations in terms of one of the variables. So we can actually do that here, right? So I, I will note that L3, I3, equals Xi minus L2, I2, right? So I've just kind of rearranged the loop closure equation to put L3, I3 on, on one side. So one implication of that is that the length of the vector on the left is L3. And that doesn't depend on theta 3 at all which means that the length of the vector on the right, which only depends on x, is also L3. So by taking the magnitude, I can eliminate the unknown direction theta 3, right? So we'll actually take the magnitude squared, 
right? So L3 I3 dot with itself is equal to X I minus L2 I2 dotted with itself, right? Because again, that's the magnitude of the left and the magnitude of the right side. And in doing so, we have eliminated this theta 3 unknown variable directly, right? We don't have to go and worry about what theta 3 is in this case. So we end up with L3 squared. And working out this dot product, I get x squared minus 2xL2. Uh, we have an i dot i2, so that's cosine of theta 2, plus L2 squared. And this ends up being the law of cosines. But I want to emphasize that I'm, I'm not starting off with the law of cosines. I'm actually kind of deriving this as part of my solution process. So now what we have here is a single equation in terms of a single unknown x. I mean, I already know the answer, right? But imagine I started with this and I just said, hey, how do I find x? Well, this is one way of doing this, right? So this is a, a second solution approach that sort of bypasses all of these transformations and then the simultaneous equations and, and, and everything we've got here. Notice that this equation has a known x, right? But everything else in this equation is actually known. I know all the lengths. That theta 2 is 60 degrees. That was part of the problem statement. So I should be able to solve this for x. So now I've rewritten the equation that we found on x, and, and I've combined some terms. So in particular, uh, L2 and L3 I brought to one side. I sort of pulled out this coefficient of x. But here it is again, and the important thing is that, that these terms in parentheses are all known. L2 and L3 are fixed lengths, and then I've given you the input angle theta 2. So this is just a quadratic equation in x, and you know, you've solved quadratic equations for probably most of your life at this point. Right? So here it is. x is equal to L2 cosine of theta 2, and I worked out the quadratic formula, and I've simplified it a bit. And then L2 cosine of theta 2 squared plus L3 squared minus L2 squared. Right? So this is the solution for x. And what we find is that when I evaluate this, I have two solutions. One of them is 115.14 millimeters, which is the one that we found before. Right, but we also have a second solution, and that's minus 65.14 millimeters. So where does that second solution come from? Well, it comes from the configuration of the mechanism. I've given you in this problem statement these lengths and this angle. It turns out that there are two configurations for the third link, this red link and this slider, that satisfy the given parts of the problem. Again, namely the, the mechanism and this input angle. One of them is, is shown here. And for this configuration, right, we have theta 3 is 25.66 degrees. And x is equal to 115 millimeters. Again, this is the solution that we found the first time we solved this. But now we see this second solution where x is equal to minus 65.14 millimeters. And so what about theta 3? Well, remember our law of sines from the previous slide sine of theta 3, and so sine of 25.66 degrees is equal to 50 millimeters, that's L2, divided by L3, which was 100 millimeters, times sine of 60 degrees. 
So, you know, we can work this number out, and, and we end up with an angle that's, say, over here. Remember our, our unit circle um, and from, from our you know, high school trig class. Um, we would find this angle as 25.66 degrees. Well, it comes from the value of sine. So this is the value of sine, right? But this also extends over to the other side of the unit circle, right? So there's actually a second solution, right? And it's given by this angle. So actually, let's draw that one in blue just to keep it distinct. Right, so this second solution ends up being, well, it turns out 180 minus 25.66. So that second solution is 154.34 degrees. And if I look at the sine of 154.34 degrees, let's move that over a little bit. Let's put that up there then everything works out, right? So the sine of this angle is the sine of that angle. And as a result, we find the inclination of our third link. Uh, let's do that one in pink. Theta 3 is 154.5. 34 degrees also satisfies the constraints of the problem. So there are two solutions here. And notice that both solutions satisfy the constraints and the problem statement. Right? So L2, L3, and theta 2 are identical. for both configurations. Now, if you're working uh, a problem, maybe on an exam or something, and you want to know which one to choose, well, uh, honestly, I would probably accept either solution, right? Because they both satisfy the constraints of the problem. They're both valid solutions. If you want to pick one, maybe pick the one that corresponds to the picture in the problem, right? But they're both equally valid, right? There's nothing wrong with either one of these solutions because, again, they're both valid configurations. I will note that there's no way to transform from the so configuration on the, on, uh, well, the upper configuration to the lower configuration without breaking the links, right? So if this link, if this input link were to move around, the red link would always stay over on the right side, and it could never jump across to this left side without, again, breaking one of the constraints. Likewise, if the mechanism started in this configuration, it could never get to this configuration, right? So these really are distinct configurations. And if you were to build this, you would be in either one or the other, right? But you couldn't switch between the two. So... That's our example for a slider crank mechanism. Um, it's our first single degree of freedom mechanism that we've really done in this class, uh, but it won't be the last. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks so much, and I will talk at you, I guess, again. Take care. Bye.